And now I share with you a continuation of our passage from Acts 2, although this will sound very familiar because you've heard it the past two weeks as well. Listen now to these words. They devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we offer ourselves to you. Grant us in these moments the ears to hear and the heart to receive all that you have for us today. O oh Lord, speak to us. Amen. For the past two Sundays and today, we have been considering vital signs. We confirmed with the help of a dictionary that vital signs are the key measurements of the body's most basic functions. So for a body, these signs include measurements such as temperature, blood pressure, pulse rate, and respiration. Because the sermon series pertains to the vital signs of a healthy church, it's the Bible, not a dictionary, that we have been looking to for answers. The second chapter of Acts is where we've discovered the vital signs of the church upon its Pentecost birth and its early days of extraordinary growth. Two weeks ago, we saw that a healthy church prioritizes relationships with one another. The descriptive phrases we read and took to heart about those early church members were met together, learned together, worshiped together, shared everything, gave to those in need, met in homes, and shared meals. Those dynamics of a close and caring community stood out and got the attention of others who also wanted to be a part of such a community. So, one of the best ways to show others that we love and follow Jesus is to love and care for one another, to accept and honor one another. In a divided world, a spirit of unity and concern can still get the attention of and help others to see Jesus more clearly. Two of our three church goals adopted early this year reflect this vital sign of prioritizing relationships. Our first goal is to promote personal relationships. The second goal is to foster community connections. Last Sunday, we continued with the same Acts 2 passage, but we looked at it a little bit differently. What we saw was how the quickly growing church of the first century was filled with people who were not only excited about being a part of a close and caring community, they were also excited about being a part of what God was doing in the world. Those early church members showed up week after week to do whatever they could to offer whatever they had. We saw that a healthy church is filled with contributors, not con consumers. Much of our daily lives as Americans really is about consuming. We show up at stores and restaurants as consumers, but that is not how we are to show up at church. 
the sign of a sick church is one where most of the people are asking, what's in it for me? Just today, we were reminded that when we joined the church, we promised to support it and its ministries by our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. We promised to be contributors. And in the first century church, we clearly see that contributing unlocked both personal and community growth. Last week, we established that each and every one of us is absolutely indispensable to what God wants to do in and through this church. We are each essential to this church's health. Today on Pentecost Sunday, we appropriately continue with Acts 2 as we move to a third vital sign. A healthy church is outward focused. When we look at the church community that was established through the power of the Holy Spirit, we clearly see that its impact extended beyond the church community. The church community that worshiped, learned, and ate together also served others together. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. The community that loved and cared for one another was also committed to the goodwill of all the people. All means not just those inside the church community, but also those outside. Because the church members' lives were so marked by love and grace, by kindness and service to others who didn't even know much about Jesus, but they wanted to be around these people. And so, day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. As the numbers grew, the newly birthed church just kept making more and more room. Those early church folks were not resistant to disruption. They were not resistant to broken, hurting, and sinful people. They were not critical of outsiders who did not know Jesus like they knew Jesus. Those new outside people were not kept at arm's length, but they were welcomed and fully invited into the community. You know, the gravitational pull of a church body is just more naturally inward. This means that the emphasis often ends up being on those who are already here. Fulfilling our needs, keeping everyone happy. Why do we do this? Well, it's because we like each other we want to be happy, and we want the people we know and like to also be happy. But the first picture we are given of a thriving, dynamic church shows us their care for one another did not overshadow their outward focus. They were a community that took seriously one of the last things Jesus said to them. Go, therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. We know these words. We know them as Jesus' great commission, and they are directed not just to pastors with seminary degrees, and the paid staff of the church, but to everyone, everyone who follows Jesus. All whose lives have been touched by Jesus have a mission to go and point others to him. Now, Jesus, I guess, could have just said, make disciples. But instead, he clarified, he qualified that statement with the word, go. Jesus knew the human heart, and our tendencies. He knew that once people start gathering, we tend to focus only on those gathering with us. Our impulse is to stay together. 
to play it safe, to stick to the inside instead of taking to heart Jesus' directive to go outside with love and hope to a world in need. Christianity is an action-based faith in which others see Jesus and experience Jesus' love through the words and actions of those who follow him. So let's take, for example, four people today. Four people who are laser-focused on getting their friend to Jesus by any means possible. Jesus was teaching in a house in Capernaum, and the crowd of people both inside and outside the house was thick and impenetrable. When they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which their paralyzed friend lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. It was the friend's faith, not the man on the mat, that stirred Jesus' heart to respond with healing that then had both spiritual and physical implications for that paralyzed man. There are people all around us who are stuck, who are held tightly by lies, fear, sin. Many of those people, they think we don't want anything to do with them. After all, we aren't going to them. We aren't inviting them. So what else are they to think? Jesus didn't ignore us. He moved towards us, offering us grace. So how might we be a church for people who have given up on church? A lot of people have given up for a whole variety of reasons. In fact, about two out of three people do not participate in any type of church or faith group. How are we fighting that gravitational pull that draws us inward, encouraging us to focus on our own wants, needs, preferences, instead of on others? What might happen today if each one of us started focusing outward and was willing to do whatever it took to get someone else to Jesus? There are a lot of people on mats. Loneliness is a huge issue, and even more so since the COVID pandemic. One out of five people are struggling with depression, and every day people are losing their lives to suicide. About one out of five is struggling with alcohol dependence, and others are paralyzed by drug addictions. There are so many people around us whose relationships with friends a spouse, a parent, children are shaky at best. And some of those relationships are completely broken. There is so much shame, desperation, grief, and hopelessness. To be a healthy church, we must focus on those who are not here, those who need Jesus, who need our help. Being outward focused is not just one thing, but it's multiple things. It's about trying new things, reaching new people. Consider those four friends and how wildly creative and willing to act that they were. New things often mean doing what others aren't doing and saying what others aren't saying. Some of those things might be uncomfortable. You may not like some of the songs we sing some Sundays, or even the sermons I preach, or some of the actions that we take. Doing something new and different can make some upset, but we still need people to be on board and willing to help. Our mission cannot be to make everyone in here happy, because if that's the case, not much is going to happen out there. Those four friends, 
didn't take their paralyzed friend to Jesus intending to make a scene and upsetting the homeowner of that house. But that's what had to be done that day to get their friend to Jesus. For us, it could mean talking with someone we don't know instead of only to our friends following worship. It could mean helping with vacation Bible school or serving runners following the Blossom Race. It could mean attending a play performance in this church sanctuary to welcome and connect with people not normally in this church. It could mean supporting a missionary so that she can reach people for Jesus that we can't. The sacrificial giving of time, talents, gifts, service, witness is necessary to introduce others to Jesus. Now, I know some of you, you are giving sacrificially, even though everything here is not exactly the way you would prefer. But you know it's not about you. So thank you. You are an inspiration, and Christ is at work in you. To be an outwardly focused church means moving towards others. We might wish that they would come to us, but we need to go to them. Consider Jesus, who took a step towards us before we ever took a step towards him. It was while we were still sinners that he died for us. To follow Jesus is to love first with no strings attached. And that's why we have various special offerings throughout the year, like Peace with Justice, Human Relations, Native American, and also UMCOR Disaster Relief. We also collect food throughout the year, donate cleaning supplies, as well as children's school supplies to the Chagrin Falls Park Community Center. We make personal hygiene kits and collect other items for the Midwest Distribution Center. We go to the Cleveland Food Bank to sort through, to pack food. We do these and other things with no strings attached because we know that Jesus uses these acts to touch and change the lives of others. A healthy church is outward focused, looking for finding ways to unleash the power of love, service, and generosity. So ask yourself, what can God do through me? What might God reach? Who might God reach through me? Am I willing to go? Much more than the few stats that I shared with you earlier in the sermon, it's names, names that move us, isn't it? Of course, some of those stats about depression and addiction might be names of people you know. Wanting others to know Jesus, to experience Jesus' love, to have hope should be personal for each one of us. Praying for and inviting others should be personal. It's not our job to change people, but it's our job to keep going to them, investing in them, inviting them, caring for and helping them. To be a healthy church, we must be outward focused. And this focus certainly meshes with our third approved church goal, which is help one another and others. So today, I invite you to take out, to take hold of that piece of paper that you received at the beginning of worship. See, it's, it's sort of brownish. It's like a rectangle. The color and shape are meant to remind you of the mat upon which the paralyzed man was lying and which his friends carried. So I want you to write the name of someone you know on one side of that paper. Someone you know. You are going to pray for and extend the love of Christ to that person. And eventually, as the Lord leads you, you will extend an invitation to come and know Christ's presence among this church body. Write the name of a person you are going to pray for 
and extend the love of Christ to. On the other side of the paper, I want you to write out one outward focused ministry, project, collection in which you will participate. Make it something you've never done before. Perhaps helping with Vacation Bible School, going to the Cleveland Food Bank, bringing in food items for the food barrel, making a personal hygiene kit, staying on Blossom Sunday to welcome community guests. Now I'm just throwing out those few ideas. My list is not an exhausted one. So if you have a different idea, write that down. While you are writing on both sides of the paper, Beverly is going to play. Please take your matte-shaped piece of paper home. Keep it. Put it someplace that reminds you to pray for the person whose name you wrote down, and also it reminds you to make plans to follow through on the outward-focused ministry, project, collection. A healthy church prioritizes relationships with one another a healthy church is filled with contributors, not consumers. A healthy church is outward focused. May it be so. Amen.